Hi. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our first uh, Cook and Share webinar. Um, my name's Raksha. I am uh, one of the program managers in the Food for Life team. Um, and I'd like to introduce Jane, who's our head of training along with Will, who's also part of the training team leading on farming and all our filming magic that we deliver um, as part of our Food for Life programme. So I'm really, really pleased that you're joining us um, this afternoon. Um, and today, so we're going to be sharing with you lots of tips and ideas on how to take part in cook and share activities um, with children, showcasing everything that you've done. And it's a really, it's it's new, it's really exciting. In fact, it's only, we're halfway through the week already. We're celebrating roast dinner day today, um, but you will find there's so many ideas, hints and tips that we will be sharing with you that you could use at any point um, that is convenient for yourselves. Um, just moving on to the next slide, I'd like to introduce um, the themes that we have um, identified. Well, thank you. So um, for Cook and Share, uh, we have it's it's a it takes place over the month of predominantly um, November, starting on the 30th of October, and we kick off with um, Halloween and bonfire nights. And I know it's already passed, but it's a brilliant time we felt um, to cook for people, cooking for people, so bringing people together, our loved ones, uh, the you know classmates, communities. We do uh, work, as you know, as yourselves in schools, and it's a great chance to celebrate school meals. Um, during that time. And we really like to bring that even more to the fore as part of um, week two, where we're looking at cooking for pleasure. So this is week commencing the 6th of October, which is the week we're currently in. And uh, this is uh, Lace's School Meals Weeks, um, where we also celebrate Roast Dinner Day. So it's a really good opportunity to um, showcase school meals, but also celebrate events this year. Diwali has fallen on the 12th of November. Um, and we're really looking at food memories and um, linking with across the generations, passing down re uh, recipes and just sharing food that we love with people that we love. Moving on to the other weekly theme, uh, week three, we are looking at cooking for the planet. So here we are um, focusing on seasonal food, organic, um, looking at food waste, looking at how we can use more local ingredients and also building in volunteering and sustainability. That All of that having a positive impact on the planet and thinking about se seasonality in the food that we're growing um, and how our encouraging our children to become more conscious food consumers, um, encouraging them even from the starting point to eat everything on their plate um, and inspiring others to, uh, you know, eat everything, as you know, in the dining hall, that's really important. Um, it's World Kindness Day on the 13th of November, so it's a really good time to also think about, you know, share social dining and bringing it together as well. Um, week four, we're looking at cooking for the pockets. So week commencing the 20th of Nove uh, November, really looking at how we can empower um, novice cooks as well as more experienced cooks on cooking on a budget. What store covered ingredients do we have? How can we explore different flavours, different using seeds and spices to create really nutritious recipes on a budget um, and um, being inspirational and using our imagination. So I'm going to just move on and give you a few ideas that the Cook and Share team have been pulling together this uh, for, for our weeks. So um, we have the Cook and Share Toolkit, and I'll share the link it shortly in the chat. Um, and it has a whole host of recipes and um, activities that can be done across the weeks. And like I said, even though we've highlighted these weeks to share um, cooking uh, recipes and ideas to get involved, they can be used at any time. And they really, really do support your Food for Life awards criteria. So we start off with making a comforting soup on there. Um, uh, Jane has created a, a great soup toolkit um, looking at lots of different seasonal ingredients across the year that can be used and, and in combination with different types of spices and different types of um, herbs to bring out a lot of flavour. 
um, I know lots of schools already do, um, do soup recipes as part of their cooking activities, but this is a way of actually encouraging schools to think about the tastes and the flavours and the spices and what they'd like to include. And um, many schools have actually invited parents or you could encourage parents to join you for roast dinner day. And this will help you with your criteria, your bronze criteria, B2.3, where we encourage parents to come in and join the children for a school lunch to see how much it might have changed since their day. Um, Going forward, we also like to look at seasonal ingredients. So thinking about using the slow cooker at this time of year, easing, easing the rising costs that we do, many of us experience with um, cooking food. How can we use utilize the so slow cooker? There's a great resource on the cook and share toolkit. And also start looking at reducing waste. So we've probably still got a few pumpkins knocking about um, after Halloween. And we'd really like to encourage, you know, lots of different recipes using pumpkin. So soup is a primary one, but there's lots of other ideas that could be used. Um, we have added on the um, Food for Life Learning and Skills Hub, you'll find lots of ideas. And one of those is seed saving. So when you do scoop out your pumpkin seeds, think about saving those seeds, um, maybe roasting them to, as a snack or even saving them to plant for the, for the new season. Again, this is going to support your uh, Gold Food for Life Awards criteria of reducing food waste, but also it will also support your, um, if you've stopped planting your, think about planting your pumpkin seeds, it will also support your growing activities of your awards criteria. Um, going back to some of the recipes that we have, uh, our team have put together a Bombay style chickpea snack, great for Diwali, which is coming up around the corner. Um, looking at lots of different spices and maybe looking at actually where those spices come from. Some are local, some maybe not so. And thinking about how they can be used um, in in the Bombay style chickpea snack recipes or any or any other recipes. So that's an opportunity to connect with your local community and start thinking about sharing some recipes. Moving on to the next one, um, to all these all these slides. Do you mind moving on to the next slide, Will, please? Thank you. So all these slides all bring together the whole cooking for pleasure and planet as well as um, as well as the other areas for pleasure and joy. So looking at reducing food waste, we are in the seasons where apples are tumbling around us um, and unfortunately quite a lot of them are left to rot. So a number of schools um, deliver apple days as part of their food activities. It's a great event where you could do apple pressing, um, which helps children understand changes of state, looking at the juice that comes out. Great to link to science, but also um, maybe introducing an apple bake-off competition involving the parents to come in and um, share their apple recipes or encourage inspiring sharing apple recipes. This is a great way to share with the community, but it also is really good at helping to reduce food waste um, and looking at the food that is local and seasonal around us. Now, on the message of reducing food waste, uh, we also have a great resource of linking, of um, creating food, vegetable crisps and food crisps from um, uh, from peelings that we also have on the cook and share uh, toolkit that's worthwhile having a look. It's worth. It's also great to know that the peels of many fruit and veg are the most healthiest and nutritious part of um, the actual um, fruit or veg. So saving those peelings is also really good for our health as well as reducing food waste. Now, when we think about some of our vegetables, um, there's loads that come out in the harvest season and one of um, it popular one is carrots. Carrots are absolutely brilliant. And um, when you think about carrots in their various different forms, there's actually a lot of learning that can take place. There's a program called Taste Ed that a lot of schools have introduced, particularly um, across, across the country, which really starts to think about connecting food with pleasure and experiences um, thinking about. So, for example, when you take a carrot and you cover your ears and you crunch down on it 
have a listen. What does it sound like? And then if you boil the carrot and crunch down on it, does it make a different sound? And how about grating it? Will that make a difference too? So this approach of actually exploring food through the senses has been inspired by Taste Ed, and it's really great for adults and children um, to explore together. It can be done in the classrooms as well as at home with parents. And there's a huge amount of resource that Taste Ed provide for free on their website. And we'll add the link to that as well. Not only that, um, we've also added a delicious carrot cake where you can explore lots of different spices and flavours. Again, that's on the Cook and Share toolkit that I will add in the link. So that's all from me. I'm going to hand over to Jane, who's got a, some exciting tomato kuchuma to talk about. So, yeah, so I've got um, three slides and then I'll go into a bit of a, a dem. <clears throat> so. I'm just showcasing three of the recipes that we've got. Um, this first one then, yeah, tomato kachumba. Um, it's sort of like a salsa recipe, but um, perhaps has more of a sort of Southeast Asian uh, flavors with cumin seeds and coriander. Um, but what I really, when I, when I come to demonstrate this, I want to show you how what looks like a very simple recipe can actually have quite a few skills that are, that are adaptable, um, that you can use with different age groups in school uh, and different, you know, children can get different things from them. Um, so, yeah, a really simple recipe just with tomatoes, onion, fresh herbs, um, some spices. Um, and a little bit of lemon juice and, and sugar to sweeten it up. Um, but the skills that will be shown are how to use, or how to develop knife skills through bridge and claw, how, how to use your hands as tools through tearing herbs and squeezing juice, and then also how to use measuring spoons. Um, so yeah, quite a, quite a good little recipe, quick, easy, um, but, but shows different skills. And then the other recipes we've got, Will, yeah. Sorry, just, just admitting right. someone in as well. Yep, there you go. There you go. So these these aren't the pictures that I've um, of the recipes I've cooked. I've taken these uh, from stock recipes, but sort of a Bombay style chickpea recipe. Um, I've got we've got the, the our own recipe for that um, based on chickpeas, and you can put some um, maybe some nuts if you wanted to put nuts in it and dried fruit like sultanas and spices and then crisps made from a variety of veg peelings or or you can just slice up the vegetables um if we go on to the next page you'll see some that my preparation uh i did them tested them out again last week um so yeah the the, the chickpea recipe then no, it's starts actually, out um it's a link that it's came up no a link came up from a food for life thingy but oh. they're going through recipes i think i said to you oh i think somebody's just got their mic on and i can hear you there we go that's probably better um so yeah uh, the, the 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 bombay style chickpeas just starts out as a kind of chickpeas um you just drain them and rinse them um dry them off, drizzle some oil and some seasonings on there, could be spices, herbs, um, and then bake them. Um, they take a little bit longer than the veg peeling crisps, which I learnt when I did them last week because they weren't quite done and, and I put them in at the same time in the oven and the veg peeling crisps had uh, frazzled to a crisp. So, um, so yeah, so they'll take a little bit longer, I think, because they're the sort of wetter and they're they've got more inside, haven't they, in a chickpea than than a thin peeling. And then the peelings, um, I've done a variety of peelings: uh, potatoes, sweet potatoes, beetroot, um, swede. I haven't done squash, but I'm sure you could do that. And again, drizzle with oil and put some seasonings on, and then roast only for about 20 minutes, um, and just watch out because they can burn. So, Will, are you going to switch? Let's see if this works. So, am I now on your screen? You, you are. You should be spotlit now, Jane. Yeah. Good. Right. So, I'm, I've just tilted my camera down so that you can see the board as opposed to to me, and I'll just show you um, how we approach teaching. Um, the knife skills through that kachumba recipe. So thinking back to what was in the recipe, it was uh, tomatoes, onion, uh, a little bit of 
either it could be mint um, or it could be some coriander. This has gone a bit soggy now. Coriander doesn't stay very nicely. Um, and then it's got a few cumin seeds in, a little bit of lemon juice, sweetened up with just a touch of sugar um, so that it, it's perhaps a bit more palatable. We don't put salt and pepper on our recipes generally, but if you want to use salt and pepper a little bit, um, then that's up to you. But obviously you need to link into the school food standards if you are cooking in school. Um, so let me just show you then how we'd, we'd approach teaching. So I've got two different sizes of tomatoes purposely because the, re the recipe sort of calls for ordinary standard sized tomatoes. But if you're working with younger children, you're probably better having something smaller for them to work with because they've got smaller hands, it's easier for them to handle. And the very simplest skill that you'll probably teach the children is how to cut something in half. So we teach them to hold whatever it is they're cutting in half, make a big arched sort of bridge, and then the knife goes underneath that bridge you check to make sure that fingers aren't in the way here and then it's a sawing action. I'm using a serrated knife and I would recommend a knife like this for schools. It's got a very short blade. I think it's uh, an eight centimetre blade um, and yeah, it works really well. Better than giving them, I have tried those safety knives for children and they've been more than useless and very expensive. So I would rather teach them how to use the correct knife, but make make sure that you're doing something that is suitable for them to be cutting. So don't give them, just throw it in the background, don't give them a like a great big swede or a butternut squash, a knife like this and they're aged five. There's not a hope that they'll cut that. Um, instead, choose something like a cherry tomato or a strawberry that they can work with. And then they can continue, find the flat side, you can just continue cutting down. So even if you know, you're making this recipe that's got quite small pieces, you can do it very safely. And it's the same principle using a, a, a big tomato. And if you always find the most stable side, you could, if you, if you didn't want to, spend extra money on cherry tomatoes because inevitably they are a bit more expensive you could give them big ones but perhaps get them to a stage where it's safer for them to handle so a nice flat side like that and then they can cut in half cut in half again and possibly although it gets a bit slippery cut in half again so yeah when everything's set down to the size you want them Get, get them into the bowl. I'm not going to go through and do all of that because it'll take me a little while and it's a bit tedious. Um, the next ingredient then is onion, um, which might be the thing when you look at a recipe and you think, oh gosh, well, I've only got six year olds. There's no way that you're going to prep an onion. So you could do a substitution and substitute for something like a spring onion, or you could use chives, um, but something that's easier to cut. So if I was substituting that red onion for a spring onion. Um, but you've got two options. You could let them snip it up with a pair of scissors, but only really if it's a skinny little spring onion like that. With a bigger spring onion, it, it's quite difficult to do that. Um, so yeah, you just have to hunt out the slimmer spring onions for them, or maybe, you could cut it in half lengthways and give them the onion like that to cut up. That works well. So usually there's there's a way that you can get round an ingredient being a bit difficult for them to handle. And what, what I would do in, in the classroom is present the ingredients on a, a tray that have already been portioned out for them. And they've been prepped to the level that you want them to start with. So we've not given them, you know, the full. If we're if we're halving the spring onion, we've done that for them. That's on the tray, and they can go ahead with that. Um, so that's that's spring onion. We'll get rid of that in the bowl. If you did want to work with 
um, an onion, a whole onion, what you need to do is cut it in half. I always cut my onions in half before I peel them. It's just something I've always done. And then, because I can usually peel them more easily um, when they've been cut. I've got a compost bowl that I keep just off camera here. Um, and then you've seen the bridge technique. Oh, what I didn't show you, let's go back to the spring onion, is the claw technique. So the other simple technique, a bit more difficult than the, than the bridge, but is when you want to slice something up. So you wouldn't use a bridge to slice up, but you'd use your three middle fingers, holding fingers, like the prongs of a fork or a little claw, a cat's claw, and pin it down on the board and then cut up and then move fingers back and cut again. So that's called the claw. Um, as Raksha said, we've got we've got these films um, or these these processes, these techniques on our website as little films um, and we'll put the link in for you. So if we're dealing with an onion, the halved onion, we've got the flat side down, we've left the root end on, we've left the stalk end on, and we'll get rid of the stalk end. And then we're going to do a combination of a bridge and a claw. So it's the same technique, but it's just a little bit more advanced. And so you put the knife almost at the root end, down on the board, and then cut. And you do that across the onion, or this could be a potato or whatever that you're dicing. This is basically a dicing technique. And it's still held together. Look at the root. It's fallen out. Then you turn, you go into that claw technique, and then you can just dice it off. When you get towards the end, it gets a bit trickier. Uh, and so you might want to say so flip it over onto that big flat side and sort of just go round and trim it off. Or you could say to the children, you leave it when it becomes a bit difficult to handle and we'll use those in a soup recipe another time. So we've got, it's a bit out of proportion here, we've got loads of onion and not so much tomatoes, but just to show you the principle. So they're in there. Um, if we're using herbs, then I've got use both mint and some coriander the mint it's the last of the mint from my garden it's just i think if we get a hard frost i'll lose it all but managed to get a little bit it smells delicious um tear off the leaves and i mean you've got different ways of doing but a fancy chefy way roll it up into like a li little bedroll and then tiny little claw it's called a chiffonade this is but you can see it's quite a high level technique because the knife is quite close to your fingers. So you might not want to be doing that with, you know, children who are just starting out on their knife skills. You could give every child a mint leaf and just get them to pick at it until it's nice and small. Um, or you could put your herbs into a jug, have a pair of kitchen scissors, and then it's it's good being in a jug because it means you hold the, the handle with your other hand so it's out of the way of the, the blades of the of the scissors. And then chop up. And what you could do if you've got lots of herbs to prep, everybody could have a few snips, pass it on to the next person. Um, so everybody has a go at doing that. So yeah, when your herbs are all chopped up how you want them, oh that smells nice. Okay. That coriander smells coming out. I'm not going to put all of it in here. So we've got a bit of coriander, a little bit of mint, and then we want some of the juice. Um, so squeezing juice, again, another good skill to teach children. Don't assume that we'll know what to do if you present them with a lemon squeezer like this. It's a case of sitting the halved lemon on that you've cut across the middle. OK, you've cut the, the oven, cut the lemon across the middle like that. And then you push, squeeze and twist at the same time so that children or anybody learning a new skill needs to understand what that skill is. You know, if they just see you doing that, they'll think you just push it on and press down. So, yeah, you're pushing, squeezing, twisting. It only needs the juice of half a lemon. 
and then a little bit of sugar in there just to dissolve and sweeten that up and pour that on and we can give it a bit of a mix. Um, one of the other things in this recipe, it allows you to use um, sets of spoons. It's out of the way. Um, I find using measuring spoons really useful and help children sort of understand their spoons. I mean, we talk about a family of spoons, a tablespoon, a dessert spoon and a teaspoon, 15 mils, 10 mils, 5 mils. So you could teach them that. And then that corresponds to these measuring spoons here. So, you know, really helps them understand proportions as well. And this, I think, needs half a teaspoon, which is the smallest one. So you can either pour it, it'd probably be easier to scoop it out and get a level spoon of cumin seeds. These would be really nice if you roasted them a little bit, but you'd probably need to do that. You could do that on an induction hob in a li little pan in front of the children, and then they could get the, the nice aromatics coming off that. And then they go in as well. Um, and then we'll combine it. Now, I haven't... Because it's not the right proportions, I've not done enough tomatoes in this, but we'll just, I'll put a little bit in a, a dish just to show you there. And I would always serve, try and serve things as attractively as you can, because you might be working with unfamiliar ingredients. You want children to try what they've made. So, you know, you'll have more chance of that if it looks nice. So that's the... The sort of the skills approach um, through knife skills. Let me just have a quick. Just going to flip my board and make it look a bit neater. Um, and then those are the two recipes that we've got. Here's some I made earlier. Um, so that's the chickpeas uh, with an addition of some cashew nuts and some raisins. Um, and then I put some garam masala uh, in there. I think there are a few fennel seeds as well. And then drizzle it with oil um, and, and roast it. And then when it came out, it just tasted a bit bland. So I put some, a little bit of salt on and then a little bit of sugar, not too much, but it gave that sweet, salty, sort of flavour that people seem to really like now and it really lifted it and then that's the mix of um the, the peeling crisps so we've got some potato that one is a sweet potato um some little carrot strips that seem to really shrivel up and beetroot and they crisp up nicely. But yeah, as I say, do watch those because they, they can burn quite easily. Um, just to show you then, if you're, if you're using, you know, big root vegetables like this and you're taking peelings, it, it, it seems like it's a simple thing, but it can be quite dangerous. Um, you've got a choice of peelers. This one I, I call the like a Yorkshire, a Lancashire peeler. Um, it's that one that's got a double sided blade suitable for left or right handed. And that one works by positioning it on the vegetable and then pulling it towards you. It really isn't designed to work like that, although sometimes people use it like that. It's particularly good if you want to go around something round. It allows you to do that really well. So apples, you know, peeling potatoes. Um, if you've got a carrot, though, you might want to use the Y peeler. Um, the only thing I would say with these is don't use it coming towards you, because if you skid off the end, you, you can end up going into your wrist. So you'd hold it and cut downwards like that. So, I mean... That's the key skill in this recipe. 
Um, and then the peelings just want to go onto a tray. When I did those that I showed you before, I put them on separate areas of the tray because I, I just thought the beetroot discolors everything, everything ends up going purple and it looks a bit nicer if they're separate colors. So you might want to, instead of like I've done there, keep them as separate piles and then you could season them up slightly differently as well. So you can use you can use different um, oils. I mean, this is just an olive oil. You could brush it on. Um, be careful, children won't be able to drizzle from that. You, you could have like a little oil drizzler with a very fine sort of spout. That might be easier for them. And then we could put on some spices. Um, Garam masala. That garam masala might be better put on afterwards. It keeps the flavour a bit better. It is designed for adding more towards the end of cooking. Smoked paprika is lovely. Um, you know, I can put a little bit of that on my carrots. Uh, I've got some harissa haris seasoning here. So it's the right side. Sprinkle a little bit of that on. And then just use your fingers to get it all covered and then that goes in the oven at about 200 degrees gas mark six and as I say they only take about 20 minutes the carrots tend to cook quicker and it depends how thick your peelings are how quickly it dries out Good of that. yeah for the chickpeas let's say it's really easy really easy recipe just a can of chickpeas that I've drained and I rinse through and then allowed to, to drain a bit more. You could get a bit of kitchen roll um, bit there and just mop them up a little bit. It will just help them crisp a bit quicker. Um, and then again, a bit of oil. The other sort of oil I, I cook with fairly often is, is a rapeseed oil. Um, that works nicely and that's is this a British one? Yeah, it's uh, grown in this country. So a little bit of oil. It doesn't need a lot. And then whatever spices we want to put in. What else have I got? Where are they? Uh, oh, I quite like nigella seeds. Oh no, that's not. It's nigella seeds mixed with other things because I was getting to the end. But it looks quite nice. I think there's a bit of sumac in there. And they just want mixing. They probably will need a little bit of salt, I have to say, otherwise they're very bland. But they're not going to have anywhere near as much salt as if you bought them ready made. And you can adjust the seasoning afterwards. I wouldn't over season them to begin with. Pepper's always good though. And then Get those onto your, your tray, spread them out and get those in the oven to roast. With your, the nuts could probably go in now because they can, they can take longer cooking. But don't put any soft fruit in at this stage, perhaps just put in at 10 minutes at the end. Otherwise they, they burn and they go horrible, don't they? So, um, so yeah, add those towards the end. And that, I think... Oops, there we go, is the snacks that we've got. So if you, yeah, you'll find those recipes in the, the toolkit. Um, they are on the Learning and Skills Hub in our recipe folder as well. Um, but yeah, happy sharing. Will? I think Will's right. going to take us back into yeah, the presentation. We'll go back into the presentation. And Will's going to talk to you about... You know, you've done all these lovely things, you've put on events, you've celebrated roast dinner day, you've cooked some nice tasty treats, you've saved some pumpkin seeds. You, you need to share it, you need to showcase what you're doing. Um, and one way that Will's had a lot of success is with making little films about it in all different formats. So he's our expert to, uh, to give you some top tips. Okay, thanks Jane, thanks Raksha. 
So as Jane just said, we've looked at the cooking side of things. So how do you share it? And as Jane said, in this in this little short session, I'm going to be looking at how you can make short films that you can upload to your school website. Um, you might post it on your school social media, whether that's YouTube, whether it's Instagram. Um, you might be putting it on the school Facebook page, maybe even TikTok, those kind of little social media sites. Um, another way you can share ideas and films is exactly what, what Jane has done is through a live stream, um, through Facebook, something like that. There is a project already that's called Farmer Time, which does live streams with farms um, into classrooms. Children can ask farmers questions. And exactly like that, you could also do this with local chefs or something like that. Go to their restaurant and get them to share what they're doing online. That could be recorded. And again, that could be uploaded to your school websites. Um, so the easiest film to do is creating and sharing a simple photo film. And the way in which you can do that is think about what Jane has just shown you. Take a photograph of each stage of that and then using an online editing app, photo editing app or, or film editing app like iMovie, um, you can add your photos into that app and then you can show each stage of the cooking process. And that would create a really, really simple, easy to easy to do film. Um, you can add explanatory text onto each of those photos as well. Um, once you've got them in order. So the example you can see here, they're kneading the bread dough at this stage. And if you again stitch all your photos together with a bit of explanatory text, straight away you've got a little video of a recipe that you can share online to children, to parents and even to other schools possibly. Uh, the next thing that you might want to think about is if you want to move beyond um, photographs, you can start to collect film and you really are entering into the realms of Hollywood blockbusters at this stage. So the first thing you want to be thinking about before you start recording any video or taking any photos indeed is where you're going to be sharing that final film. If it's on um, YouTube, as you can see in this example here, here's one that we produced, How Honey is Made, or is it going to be on a format such as Instagram and TikTok? And depending upon which one will depend upon how you film your film. So as we can see here, um, you've got two different ways, landscape or portrait. And when you're filming or photographing in portrait, um, you'll notice that you'll get black bars on either side of the film when you're viewing it. And this kind of format is best used for those social media platforms that I've just mentioned, such as Instagram and TikTok. Um, and they're specifically designed for viewing on handsets. Um, if you're going to be doing a film like this, then portrait might be the way to go. Alternatively, landscape mode is best used when you're making more traditional looking films. Um, it may be that you're posting your film on the school website or you might be putting it on YouTube. And in which case, this kind of landscape mode that you can see here, you can see it transitioning from portrait there to landscape. Landscape is probably going to be better for those type of formats. So think about your footage when you're filming. Um, this is a young lad up at Washington Academy that we went and did some work with. Um, he was great with his iPad and he was all around the cooking session, getting as much footage as he could whilst he was doing the filming. Gather lots of different shots from different angles. And these will all help when you get to the editing mode, when you're starting to piece your film together, starting to tell the story. Loads of different angles will help you to tell that story. So what's in shot? Think about where your subject is positioned. So in these shots here, you can see the children were peeling out potatoes for jacket potatoes and they were um, weighing out their ingredients. Um, lots of people getting in the way. So check that the camera is able to record everything clearly and that there's nothing obscuring your shot. And here you go, here's some better shots. As I say, 
think about where the camera is. Is it looking over a shoulder or is it round the front? Have you got a good view of exactly what's going on? And as you can see in these shots, nice green tick next to them. Lovely shots that really demonstrate what was going on in the classroom on that day. Lights, camera, action. Think about the position of the light source. Where is the sun? Where are the lights or whereabouts are the windows in the building if you're filming inside? One thing that people often do a lot of the time is they place the person in front of the light source. So you can see here that Washingborough Academy have placed Chef right in front of the window there. And what is happening there is that the camera has focused in on the light that's coming from the window and it's adjusted to the light that's coming from the window. But by doing so, what's happened is that it's slightly underexposed chef. So he's looking a little bit too dark for the film. So in order to avoid that, make sure you position your subject so they're lit at the front. So the way to do that is face them towards the sun if they're outside. Um, face them towards a light if they're inside or face them towards the window and immediately you can see the difference with chef here when he was facing the window and I'll just flip back to the previous one there we go there's chef when he's standing in front of the window so always think about the position of your subject and how, how you're lighting them so keep it steady I feel seasick looking at this one. Shaky footage has it place in a scary movie, as it says, um, but definitely not in a cookery film. Um, often young young people can be a little bit, um, they can find it a little bit tricky when they're filming with things like iPads. Um, so there's ways that you can avoid this really simply and cheaply. Um, you might not have access to a tripod for your handset or your iPad. So you can do what this lad was doing here. Um, quite simply resting his elbows on a little wall in the classroom. Um, if not, if you haven't got a wall like they've got here, you can improvise by standing the camera on a solid surface. You might have a couple of cardboard boxes you could stand the camera on. Or quite simply, ask the camera operator, once they're holding the phone or once they're holding the iPad, is to brace their elbows up against their body. And that often helps to cut down on camera shape as well. Just um, trying to get my microphone on for this bit. Um, there we go. That's what I'm after. OK. Bringing that together, talking about it and really enjoying and loving food is probably the one highlight of our day, perhaps, that brings everybody together. So as you can hear there, the sound was really, really nice and clear. Um, and what we did when we were doing that one was we waited um we waited until there was nothing that could be heard in the background so we positioned this lady in a nice little quiet area had a listen were there any cars in the background if so just wait a minute you know are there any fire engines going past or anything like that again if so just hang on a second and wait for them to go past if there is something that's a constant drone maybe something like an air conditioning unit you might think about moving somewhere quieter the general rule is the closer you have that person to the microphone, the better the sound will be. And sound really can make or break a film. So if you do have something going on in the background, you'll really notice it when you move to move to editing the editing stage. And on the next slide here, we've got an example of some some bad Bringing sound. That together, talking about it and really enjoying the living food is probably the one highlight of our day that brings everybody together. Bringing that together, talking about it, and really enjoying and loving food is probably the one highlight of our day, perhaps, that brings everybody Um. So yes, it's really important. You know, what did we have there? We had some loads of noisy seagulls. Someone was starting their car. Um, it may be that it's a very, very windy day and you might have wind blowing onto the microphone, anything like that. That can absolutely kill a video dead. So really, really have a think about what noises are going on in the background um, before you start recording. And there's some top tips to think about in terms of the actual filming um, and then the next stage once you've got all of your 
footage together is you're going to be editing your film. Um, there are, depending upon what format you're using, whether you've got an Android handset tablet or whether you've got um, Apple handset or iPad, there's loads of different types of free editing apps that you can download um, on uh, Android. Um, you've got apps like DaVinci Resolve. Um, on Apple, you've obviously got iMovie, all of which are free. Um, so have a look around, download that app. Once you've done that, it's going to be quite simple as importing those film clips into the editing app and just start playing around with the software. Include the children as well. I've done these sessions with children so many times and you find out, you know, they children probably know a lot more than we do as adults. A lot of the time they've probably done this. Uh, you know they've done, done this loads of times at home with with ipads that are floating around at home so if you're feeling like a little bit out of your league perhaps then get the children involved and i'm sure they're 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 they'll, they'll, they're experts at, at what they're doing and then what we've done is we've been working on an international project over the last couple of years called digital food education um, and as part of that project, we've been working with three European partners to develop a really wide range of resources that support settings, helping them to record and share their food education in new and exciting ways. What I'll do now is I'll just come out of this PowerPoint um, and I will come into the digital food education website here just so you can have a quick look at it. Um, I definitely recommend coming here and having a look. There's loads of online resources that you can use that will help you to create these kind of food focused films and allow you to share them to, to a wider audience. So on this section here at the top called Foodie Filmmakers, what we've done is um, we've created some online tools that you can use with the children um, to find out more about where their food comes from and how they can record those food journeys. So we've got three sections here, filming on the farm, filming in the garden, um, all relevant to this webinar today, filming in the kitchen. And if we just go into the filming in the kitchen section, um, we've created what are called online interactions. Um, and what you can do with these interactions is you can work through them, click through them. This one is cooking. And then when you get into this section, there's three parts to it. Researching cooking, producing your film and then editing and sharing your film. And so I won't go through it all now, but in terms of the research, our first job as filmmakers is to find out more about cooking. We can do this by working with the children to research different recipes and what they'd like to cook. And so in this section, you're introducing different foods to the children. And there's loads of little interactive activities that you can do with the children um, as part of the process of, of working, working through the interactions. Um, the other thing that we've got here in the what works well section, We've got loads of best practice case studies, um, ideas of different types of films you can make, a growing microgreens film in terms of cooking, an international crest growing live stream, a school seed saving film, filming a cooking session, food interviews. So loads of ideas once you are really, really getting underway with your cook and share. If you want a bit a few more pointers, then head over to the digital food ed education website and there'll be loads of loads of ideas that can hopefully help you. And that is it for me. If I just um, go back to this next slide here. Um, we've created a link here where we'd love to get some feedback from you. Raksha, have you posted that up? The link a moment ago, along with all the other links that have been mentioned today um, in the in just now. So please go and have a look 
uh, at the sites and please do fill in the feedback form. It'd be really good to get your um, comments on what you found useful and any learning that you might have.